Welcome, everybody, to the annual Beyond the Whistle March Madness podcast. We'd like to welcome you over here to the podcast room. I'm your host, Ryan Bell, here with PJ Neville, Brendan Bailey, and Henry Lapin. And guys, how are we all doing today? Doing yeah. great. Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Excited for, you know, to talk about some college basketball March Madness. This is great. It's time of year. Absolutely, PJ. So I think what we're going to first start off with your guys is what sticks out to you in the bracket? And Brendan, I'll start with you. And in particular, those number one seeds, do you think the committee got them all right? Uh, I'd say for the most part, uh, I wouldn't disagree with any of the one seeds. I think uh, you see Purdue past few years definitely uh, struggled early on in the tournament. But I think in on this regular season, they definitely deserve that one spot. So I'd say overall, committee didn't do too bad of a job. Yeah, I think I'm just going to, you know, I think, you know, those – that Purdue, Houston, and UConn ones, those ones are pretty solid, right? Those have been the top three teams for the majority of the year. UNC, that's a little, you know, you could get into some specifics, you know, make an argument for Tennessee or Iowa State, but for the most part, I think I think UNC is the right choice. Yeah, um, got to agree. I think UNC, I think they do deserve to be the number one seed. UConn, obviously, they're just on a whole nother level. Um of dominance throughout this league and Purdue, we can probably expect another choke, but they've been solid throughout the regular season and they definitely also deserve number one seed. Yeah. PJ, I agree with you for North Carolina. I think that was the only one that was kind of up in the air talking about Iowa state winning the big 12 championship. But I'd say for the most part, I agree with what the committee did. All right, Brendan, going back to you, are there any other teams that you think should be seated higher? Uh, I'd say, for me, I'd say New Mexico has been really hot as of late. So I think if there's any team that I think could have been pushed up a little bit higher, uh, I'd say New Mexico at 11 seems a little bit low for them. Yeah, PJ? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I think some teams could be lower, but, you know, for the most part, I think a lot of the, you know, top top dogs are well-seeded. Maybe James Madison, they've, you know, they've been pretty strong this whole season. Obviously, right, they don't have as strong of a schedule, but I think, you know, you can make an argument for them to be a 10 or an 11. Um, I think GCU, Grand Canyon, uh, I think they should be ranked a little higher. Um, they're definitely very hot and cold at times, but I think they could definitely make a run into this March Madness, and I think they should be ranked a little higher, definitely. Yeah, I kind of agree with some of those 12 seeds, like Grand Canyon, James Madison. I think it's very odd that Duquesne's an 11 seed because they're 24 and 11. I'm surprised that they gave the Atlantic 10 winner that 11 spot rather than GCU or another 12 seed like that. So that's probably what's most surprising for me. And then, Brendan, last four in, first four out. Do you think the committee got it right, or what would you change about it? I think no matter what the committee chose, there would be arguments, there would be people uh, all upset no matter what the – First four, uh, first four out and the last four in were. But I'd say it does seem like there was a little bit of a prejudice against the um, Big East this year. Um, there was definitely at least probably like three teams that were right on the cusp there, and um, none of them getting in was kind of questionable. But again, there's always going to be um, some controversy no matter what the picks are. Yeah, I think – you know, obviously there are some teams that would have been in, but this year, you know, there's so many bid stealers that kind of, you know, Seton Hall, St. John's, a couple of those guys could have gotten in. A lot of those Big East teams, you know, they could have gotten in, but with all those bid stealers, they really, you know, just kind of got the short end of the straw. Um, yeah, I think there are definitely some um, things that a lot of people will change. Uh, I think Virginia and Oklahoma, definitely questionable that they could have been swapped, but on uh, committee's choice and it was definitely kind of hectic coming down to the wire for their decisions and the final weeks of the regular season but I think they did an okay job with it yeah I definitely think a little bias against the Big East St. John's wasn't even in the first four out you have Oklahoma Seton Hall Indiana State which as you mentioned PJ if there weren't so many bid stealers I would have loved to see Indiana State yeah. in the tournament with uh, Robbie Avila Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was his nickname but it was the cream with the C yeah. I don't know, if you guys know that but and Pittsburgh is that last team out. So, again, the bid stealers are what kind of changed everything up. But if not for them, I would have liked to see, you know, St. John's and Seton Hall in the tournament. So, you know, speaking of the first four, that's tonight and tomorrow. And then when those matchups are finalized, then we'll have the first round, the round of 64 being on Thursday and Friday. So, Brendan, what are your most intriguing first round matchups you're looking at? Um, yeah, I'd say obviously there's a lot 
round of 64, those few days this weekend are some of the best days all year. But I'd say, for me, the Wisconsin-James Madison 5-12 matchup, and I'm a little bit of a Badgers fan, so I might be kind of biased there. But as you said, James Ma Madison um, has been dominant all year, not with the best strength schedule. So it's going to be interesting to see how they match up against a solid team like the like Wisconsin. And I think that that's definitely a matchup to look out for. Yeah, I think, you know, there's definitely a couple. I think that FAU Northwestern one, right? FAU, a lot of people are saying that they're ranked higher than they should be. But FAU, this is a team that made it to the Final Four last year. They were ranked throughout the year. And I think FAU, they've got a lot of tournament experience. They could get that one done. And then also just going down to the Midwest, Gonzaga McNeese. I, I mean, that, right, McNeese, that's, you know, that's a team that a lot of people probably have never even heard of. But they, they're on fire this year. Gonzaga, that's a program that, you know, is starting to almost kind of see a decline. And I think, you know, McNeese, they can get it done if, you know, they come to play. Uh, I'm going back to another 512. I'm going San Diego State UAB. Um, I think San Diego State could be on upset alert. Um, UAB, very hot and cold this season. Their offense is um, up to par, I think, with San Diego State. Defense definitely lacking, but um, we've seen crazier things happen. I definitely think San Diego State could be a first round exit. Yeah, I, I think there's so many intriguing first round matchups. You could honestly say maybe 75% of them, but PJ, yeah. I know you mentioned the Gonzaga McNeese State. I think McNeese could definitely win that game. I mean, Will Wade is their head coach. He was the head coach of LSU for multiple years until those allocations. So he knows how to coach his players in big time games. Then Kansas Samford's another one yeah, of those that, interesting first round matchups where too. could be an upset. Honestly, that whole Midwest region, I think all those first round games are interesting. And then it's one more, I think that New Mexico Clemson game, New Mexico coming in as the 11th seed are favorited. So it could be the Lobos in that matchup, but really every game in the first round is intriguing. So Brendan, who has the easiest path for a team in the entire tournament? Uh, I'd say it's tough to really pick one, but I'd say I'm looking at the Midwest here and the Midwest region, and there's a lot of the higher seeds aren't uh, really at their, at their best right now. And so I think Purdue could kind of have a pretty, pretty light walk into the Elite Eight until they uh, face either Tennessee or a Creighton maybe. But I think Gonzaga, as PJ was saying, has not been the best this year. Kansas has, um, is banged up now. So I don't really see them making it super far. And even if they do, I think that's a team that Purdue could handle. And so I think Purdue has a pretty um, light region in order to get to at least the Elite Eight. Yeah, I think, you know, just going back to that East region, right, it's really UConn's to lose this is a team, they've been the top dog all year long, right? You've got FAU and San Diego State, who were both Final Four last year, along with UConn. But, you know, those are two teams, right? They lost kind of their star players, and now, you know, they're almost, I don't want to say rebuilding, but they're definitely not where they were last year. And, I mean, outside of them, it's really just UConn, Iowa State, and Illinois. I mean, the four seed in that is Auburn, who you know, hasn't shown to be the strongest this year. Well, they won the SEC championship. Yeah, so. yeah, but I mean, you know, just overall UConn and Iowa State, I think that's a lot of people's Elite Eight East region matchup. And I think, you know, whoever wins that is really, you know, that's kind of the easiest path. I'd have to disagree with you there, PJ. I think I agree, obviously, UConn has been dominant all season. Um, I think Auburn does match up with them well. And as Ryan said, SEC champs, they're kind of um, hitting their stride at the right part of the season. So, yes, I think it is UConn's region to lose, of course. But I think they could have some, a few tough matchups to get to the Final Four. Yeah, I think we're all in agreement that UConn winning the East is would maybe be the least surprising um, and easiest path um, of any team. I mean, they're just playing on a whole nother level. And um, I think that they don't really face a true risk of losing until they play Auburn uh, or San Diego State. And after that, it'll be Illinois or Iowa State. Um, the odds are favoring. And I think UConn, uh, I think it should just be a cakewalk for the East. Yeah, you guys have been throwing out the East region. I'm going to talk about the West region a little bit. I think especially for UNC, I think that's a very easy path to the Elite Eight. If you obviously have your 16 game, I think they'll play Michigan State in the second round. 
And then I'm high on Grand Canyon. I think they could absolutely make the, make the Sweet 16. That would be a very favorable draw for North Carolina. But even if they play Alabama in the Sweet 16, very faulty defense from the Crimson Tide, so North Carolina can score. I think they'll get into the Elite Eight fairly easy, but I think they'll match up with Arizona, and obviously Caleb Love will want a little bit of revenge. So if it is North Carolina versus Arizona in the Elite Eight, that might be one of the most intriguing matches of the whole bracket. But, you know, you guys pretty much in agreement with the East. I just threw out the West there. So that's that for the most part. So kind of the question that everyone's been asking, obviously the defending champs, they've been looking so dominant this season, just won the Big East Conference Tournament. So Brennan, we'll start with you. Can UConn repeat this year? Uh, I think, of course, they are definitely capable of it. And I think they have been the best team so far this year from what they've shown us. Um, but I don't think it's possible in March to give anyone a gimme and be real, real favorites. Um, because as we've learned for years and years, um, anything can happen in March. So we'll see. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously UConn, they've definitely got a shot, really. They've kind of got an easy road to the Elite Eight, but from there, it gets really, really hard, really fast. I think North Carolina, Arizona, the winner of, you know, that West region, they'll give them a run in the Final Four. Iowa State will definitely give them a run in the Elite Eight. And then on the other side of the bracket, you've got some legit teams. I mean, that Tennessee team, even really Duke at a four seed in the South, I think if they meet in the championship game, it's going to really you know come down to the wire, be close. This is a UConn team. They're not really running through teams as much as they have been in the past. And really, I mean, you know, we saw them play close games against teams like Villanova, who... You know, I'm a Villanova fan, but we're just not very good this year. You guys went to the NIT. It's, it's fun. <laughs> But I think UConn, definitely, they've shown weaknesses. And if other teams can learn to attack, you know, it's going to be tough to win it all. Um, yeah, like Brandon was saying, uh, I think UConn's definitely got a shot to win it, but there's no gimmies. Um, since March Madness has been created, uh, there's only been seven teams all time who have gone back-to-back -back championships. And I think um, UConn, I think they're just a whole nother level out of everyone in this tournament. So um, I think they, I think they should be favorites. But again, we've seen crazier things happen in March. Yeah, I think UConn absolutely they can repeat, but the path gets tough when they reach the Final Four, which I think we all think they'll make it to the Final Four. I think the East Region might be a little bit of a cakewalk, but obviously there are going to be some tough games in there. But that Final Four, PJ, you're kind of talking about it, whether they play a North Carolina or an Arizona, and then getting to the final could be a Houston, a Kentucky. You know, some people think Purdue or Tennessee. That's where it's going to really be important to see how Danny Hurley wants to coach those yeah. guys up. I think Donovan Klingon's going to have to really step up because last year, you know, wasn't getting as much minutes because he was the younger guy. And now this year, stepping up into such a big role, you know, being seven foot one, but also guys like uh, Stefan Castle and Tristan Newton. You know, Tristan Newton gets like triple doubles, seems like yeah. almost every other week. So he's got to step up. But I think absolutely UConn can repeat, but will they be able to? I'm not too sure about. All right, so going back to the round of 64, which is on Thursday and Friday, I want to hear some upset picks from each of you guys. Brendan, we'll start with you. Maybe give me not just one, maybe two to three predictions for upsets you're looking at. All right, so I think, of course, I got a lot of different upsets in my bracket, but I think focusing in on the Midwest region, I think that that's definitely a, a place where you can see a lot of different things happening. Um, as I said, a weak uh, and hurt Kansas team, a sort of a down year for Gonzaga. I could see McNeese and Sanford maybe both winning and then facing each other in the round of 32, which would be very interesting. And then also I think Oregon's a very solid team um, for that 6-11 matchup. So I think the Midwest, you could see um, a pretty wild first round. Yeah, I think, you know, going back to that Midwest, Brendan, I think, you know, one thing not to leave it out of, the realm of possibility is St. Peter's as a 15 yeah. seed again. I mean, if they're able to make another run, right, they don't have Doug Eddard again, but this is still, you know, St. Peter's as a 15 seed. We've seen it just two years ago. They can make a run, and obviously I, I think Tennessee is going to win that one, but you can't can't leave it past them. Then I also like, I like NC State against Texas Tech in that 6-11 matchup. NC State, this is a team they won five straight games in five days, the lowest seed to win an S or sorry, ACC tournament. And, you know, they they showed that they could beat Duke and UNC. So this is a program that they're not to be messed with. And then also in the South, that 5-12 matchup with James Madison in Wisconsin. I think James Madison, 
You know, this is a strong defensive team. We've already talked about them. That's going to be a good one against Wisconsin, who's a very offensively heavy team. Um, yeah, all three of my upsets, all in the West. Um, I got Michigan State over Mississippi State, as well as Nevada over Dayton. And I'm also going GCU, Grand Canyon over St. Mary's, uh, another 5-12. Um, I think Michigan State, um, I think they're playing with a little chip on their shoulder, then knowing they're a little lucky to be in this tournament. And I think they're going to try to um, prove that they deserve to be here, they deserve to stay, and I think they're going to beat Mississippi State first round. Yeah, I think in that South region, I definitely lean towards NC State, as you mentioned, mentioned PJ, only the second team ever to win those five games in five days in the yeah. conference tournament behind 2011 UConn, who ended up winning the whole thing with Kemba Walker. So I think NC State's definitely interesting. Duke, Vermont, I, I'm going to pick Duke, but I think Vermont, they have so much tournament experience because they really just farm the American East because no one else is <laughs> really good in that conference. So Vermont could definitely make some noise. Obviously, JMU against Wisconsin would be a popular upset pick. I look in the East region, I think Drake at the 10 seed against Washington State in that first round. Tucker DeVries, his dad is the coach as well, but he's one of the best players all of mid-major America. And I think if they match up with Iowa State in the second round, definitely possibility for an upset. I'm picking it, but regardless, I think that's just a good game. And then down in the West, I think New Mexico will be Clemson in the first round. A lot of sneaky good guards on that team. And if they match up with Baylor in the round of 32, that could really go either way. So I wouldn't even be too surprised if New Mexico makes a Sweet 16 run. But regardless, I think this year, compared to last year, no 12 seeds won last year. And I think this year there's possibility for three or maybe even yeah. all four. Yeah. So that could really go either way. All right, Brendan, we're going to go back to you here. Going back to our bubble talk a little bit. So we kind of briefly mentioned it earlier, but maybe a little more in depth now. Who do you think got snubbed and uh, shouldn't have got in compared to teams who did get in maybe with worse resumes? Uh, yeah, as I said previously, um, the Big East definitely seemed to – get snubbed a little bit there. I think also Indiana State was a very solid team all year. They had um, tournament uh, aspirations all year, and then they ended up falling short, of course. And as PJ and you, Ryan, were talking about, um, teams that just get the bid will obviously take those spots sometimes. So I think um, Indiana State would be my pick. That definitely – had a very strong argument to get into the tournament. Yeah, I agree with that. Indiana State, I mean, they were ranked at one point, then they had that tough loss to, was it Iowa State or uh, Illinois, Illinois, Illinois State. State? Yeah, one of those two I states. But then, um, you know, that's a team that could have definitely gotten in. They showed their strengths all year long. And then I think, you know, that um, – Seton Hall team and St. John's really St. John's not even being in the first four out is kind of a shocker. They took UConn to a 95 90 game. That's pretty unheard of in college basketball. And, you know, that's a team that showed that they could hang with some of the best teams all year long, right? They beat Villanova once again, my team. And, you know, also Seton Hall in the big East Seton Hall. They're another team in the first four out who, Definitely had a strong resume to get in. I think if they made a little bit of a deeper run in the Big East tournament, they would have been able to do it. Um, yeah, I think Oklahoma and Pittsburgh, two of those teams in the first four out, uh, I think they definitely should have deserved to be in. Um, and people who barely got in, Virginia and I think Texas A&M, um, I don't think they were one of the stronger teams um, going into the selection. I thought there was a good chance they wouldn't even be in this. But um, they got in, you know. Football schools, um, I think they have a good chance. But Oklahoma and Pittsburgh, uh, I think that was uh, very unlucky for them. Yeah, I think going back to Seton Hall, PJ, they beat UConn this year. They're one of the few teams that actually beat UConn at home. Granted, that was in December, so really early yeah. in the conference season, but still a win against UConn. But yeah, I, I was talking about Indiana State. I agree with Pittsburgh. And Oklahoma is interesting. They didn't lose a game outside of quad one. So all their losses were two quality opponents. And especially in the Big 12, that's such a tough league where every game matters. And, you know, they just kind of missed it. And then obviously St. John's losing some early season games. I think losing to Michigan in November really hurt yeah. because Michigan was not a good team all year. And same for Pittsburgh, lost to Missouri, who I think went 0-15 in SEC conference play. So those losses early season, while maybe it's most fans are not thinking about them, they obviously matter. And then Leighton, I know you uh, mentioned Texas A&M. And I think Michigan State was a was that 19-14 record. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. Tom is it's the brand, right? Tom is yeah. obviously being one of the best coaches. I still think they're going to win the first round as most pe most people do. But, you know, with that record, it kind of brings to question what the you know selection process is for the committee. 
All right, Brendan, we're going to our last question here. It's kind of what everyone's been waiting for here. What are your final four predictions and who's going to win it all? All right, so for me, final four, coming out of the East, I have Iowa State over UConn. Um, of course, UConn, very strong team. I think a lot of people are going to have them making the final four and maybe winning it all. But I think Auburn's a tough matchup for them, and Iowa State is a great team. So I have Iowa State making it, and then also UNC out of the West. I think that they have a pretty easy schedule up until um, the Elite Eight where they could play Arizona, which would be an absolutely electric game against um, Caleb Love, of course. Um, and then Midwest, I have Tennessee. I simply just can't trust Purdue enough to put them in there based off the past few years. And then I also have Kentucky, who I think would be the biggest surprise, I guess, uh, in my Final Four. And I think their offense is just unmatched. They have great players, Rob Dillingham, Reed Shepard, both phenomenal all year long. And, um, yes, their defense is definitely uh, – might be a little bit of a weak point, but – um, any team that can go on a run in March definitely is a chance. So I have them making the Final Four. And then championship game, I would have UNC and Tennessee with UNC winning it all would be my final pick. Yeah, so I've got, you know, I think UConn, Iowa State, that might be the biggest Elite Eight toss-up, right? You've also got, you know, what I would think is a UNC-Arizona Elite Eight matchup also. I think those two are really the biggest toss-ups in my bracket I've got UConn and UNC winning both of those, so the top seeds. I think, you know, UNC, it's really just going to come down to the tournament experience compared to Arizona. Really, it's just Caleb Love on that team. And then, you know, obviously UNC, great coaching also. Um, and then coming out of the south, I've got Duke, another one where it's kind of just tournament experience. This is a Duke team who made it to the Final Four along with UNC just two years ago. Uh, I think Houston, that's another team that can get it done. I think that's going to be a really good Sweet 16 matchup. But I think Duke, you know, barely edges them. And then um, I think Tennessee gets it done. Uh, I think Purdue really gets out early, and Tennessee is able to get there to the Final Four. Uh, yeah, I'm going to start off with my easiest pick. I think that's going to be UConn winning the East. Um, again, I don't really see competition until they're in the – um, Sweet 16 and Elite 8. Um, winning the winning the West, uh, I got to go with UNC. Again, RJ Davis, great shooting guard, um, <laughs> point guard. Um, he's great uh, from three-point line, and I think that they're just going to kind of walk away with it. Um, winning the South, I got to go agree with Brendan. I think Kentucky. Um, I think, again, that great offense um, going to help them out a lot. Defense, they're going to have to make some changes going into March. Um, and my most controversial pick, I think, is Gonzaga. Wow. Oh, winning, Gonzaga. Uh, okay. winning the Midwest. <laughs> okay. Very controversial pick. I think I might be alone on this one. I think a lot of people yeah, have been I, getting first yeah, rounded. I, yeah, first I, round I, exits, I still believe in them. Okay. Um, I think what you said earlier, how they're on the decline of kind of their um, just dominance um, in college basketball, I think they know that. I think they're still going to try to – I think they're still going to push. I still think they're going to make it to the Final Four. Wow, interesting pick there. Yeah. Okay, well, all right, so what about your Final Four picks and then your national champion? Oh, Final Four, uh, championship game, I got UConn and Kentucky, and I think UConn's going to win it. I think they're going to repeat, make it the eighth team to ever repeat. All right, so for me in the East, I think we're all in agreement. I got UConn. I don't have them playing Iowa State in the Elite. I have them going against Illinois, just I think Iowa State is prone to a second-round upset to Drake. But regardless, U UConn playing in Boston, that's where the regional is. They should be able to handle that. Uh, I think the West region, I'm going with Arizona. I think all you guys are going with UNC, but I still have UNC in the Elite Eight. I just think UNC versus Arizona, especially in that West region, out West, Arizona, their fans are going to travel really well. Caleb Love, maybe something a little on his shoulder, right? He's going to yeah. try and – Form as well as he can. So I got Arizona moving over to the South. I'm the only one here with Houston. You two think I'd, you had Kentucky, right? You had Duke. Yep. Yeah. I have Houston beating Duke uh, in the Sweet 16, which just side note, hopefully no fans storm the court and Kyle Filipowski doesn't break his leg. <laughs> um, and then I have Houston beating Kentucky in the Elite Eight. That's going to be a fun matchup, though. Those are, I think Houston, probably the best defensive team, March Madness. You want to make that argument versus Kentucky, who can score 100 points at the yeah. snap of a finger. But I got Houston. And then the Midwest, I'm going Tennessee as well. 
I love Dalton Connect. He's just a guy. He can score the ball really well. He can just swing it around. But that whole Tennessee team as a whole, I think that they have the key. If they play Purdue in the Elite Eight or Gonzaga, okay, Gonzaga. <laughs> but you know, no matter who they play, I got Tennessee. And then I got UConn, Arizona. Give me the Huskies. I think that's a great matchup as well in Phoenix. So Arizona, I'm kind of more towards that home court, but I'm going to go UConn. Houston, Tennessee, give me Houston. I think the defense will slow down Tennessee. And then UConn, Houston in the national championship. I'm going with Houston. I think most people would maybe pick UConn there, but you mentioned that stat. That's really hard to go back to back. I think only seven times hasn't yeah. happened since Florida in the mid 2000s. So I'm going with the Cougars to win that one and 74 71, by the way. So if I get that one right, <laughs> I'll pat myself on the back there. But okay, that's it for uh, the final questions for all of us. Are there any last thoughts? If you guys just want to have one last thing about the bracket you want to say? Uh, no, nothing really. Uh, I'd say I'm very surprised by the Gonzaga pick. I think McNeese has a better chance of winning it all than Gonzaga, but we'll see. Maybe that, maybe that prediction will pan out for Henry, but no, that's all I got. I think, you know, I just want to highlight how we haven't really talked about Marquette at all. I think they're, you know, kind of one of the weaker two seeds in really maybe even the history of the tournament. This is a Marquette team who, you know, right, they made it to the Big East Championship game, lost to UConn without Tyler Kolek. But I think, you know, really when it comes to the big stage last year, they didn't do too well. And this year, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I just don't have that high of an outlook for Marquette. I think, you know, Sweet 16 might be their peak. Maybe they make it to the Elite Eight, but I think Kentucky is a better overall team and is able to outlast them. Uh, I mean, final thoughts. I think that in the South, um, I think there are three teams that I could absolutely see making it to the Final Four, even to the championship game. I think Duke, Kentucky, and Houston um, all have a great chance to uh, make it to the Elite Eight, Final Four, or even to the championship game. I can all see them um, being strong, strong offensively, and I wouldn't be surprised with any of them. Yeah, I think for me, I'm just wondering, are we going to see a 15 or possibly a 16 scene win, th win this year? Yeah. I think that's a more weaker compared to the last couple of years. PJ, you mentioned Marquette. I really wouldn't be surprised if Western Kentucky won. I mean, I don't know too much about them, but they won the CUSA conference. I'm pretty sure I saw a statistic that they, they really try to move the ball as much as they can. They're one of the higher pacing teams in all of March Madness. So maybe that could be a potential upset there. Um, you know, to some other teams, Houston, I don't think they're going to lose to Longwood or anything like that, but I'm just going to want to say there's going to be a 15 or 16 win. It's probably not going to happen, but yeah. if it does, then that's what makes March Madness so special. But all right, that's it from us here at for the Beyond the Whistle March Madness podcast. We hope everyone has a good rest of your day and we'll see you around.